Good morning. Let us pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the fellowship of our spirits be pleasing to you, O oh God, our Father. We pray these things in your Son, Jesus' name. Amen. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. The word mercy invokes a variety of thoughts for us, and certainly for me. And as I prepared for this message, something that I could not get out of my mind was the game, Mercy. And in an ideal world, I would get two kids to come up here and play Mercy, but, you know. The game uh, we played is pretty universal. Um, most of us, I think, played it when we were kids. I certainly did, even um, in Thailand. Two people stand facing each other with their hands like this, and then they intertwine their fingers. And then when the game starts, they can't remove their hands from each other or move their feet um, off the ground that they're standing on. But they can do pretty much anything else to inflict pain on the other person until the other person claims mercy, and then you no longer inflict pain on that person. By claiming mercy... You're saying, I give up. Show me mercy in, in my time of weakness. I'm sorry, by these blank stares, am I the only one who played this? Oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> Everybody seems to be looking at me like, oh, that's fascinating. <laughs> I mean, it is as a, as a kid. Anyways, while this game was fun and, you know, games, the definition of mercy was certainly within this childhood game. Even though I barely understood what the word mercy meant, I learned what it looked like. And later, I was taught that the definition of mercy was not receiving what you deserved. And according to dictionary.com, which I actually prefer to Webster's, is compassion shown toward another in one's power. But there's so much more to mercy than that, and sometimes it is helpful to look at what something is not in order to define it. In Matthew 9, verses 10 through 13, depicts a scene where Jesus sat down with his disciples for dinner, and tax collectors and sinners had joined in with them. The Pharisees were not satisfied and asked Jesus, why do you eat with the sinners and tax collectors? And Jesus says to them, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Jesus contrasts mercy with sacrifice. What he is saying is that he wants God to be alive in their hearts and not just in empty actions. He does not want people who perform religious duties out of a formality, but out of true affection. Matthew 9 is ripe with miracles that Jesus performs, healing the sick and the blind, the needy. He heals the paralytic. He raises a young girl to life. The bleeding woman is healed in Matthew chapter 9. The blind, two blind men regain their sight. A mute man starts to speak. He was and is their great physician. And he is calling out to the tax collectors who were indeed rich and to the Pharisees who were and did well to do as well and healthy. But both were also in need of healing with the medicine that only Jesus, the physician, the great physician, could bring. They abided to rules and regulations, the tax collectors and Pharisees, and their life was ruled entirely by the mechanical implications of rules. They were enslaved to trivial issues of ceremonial cleanliness and could not see that they too needed healing. Jesus was saying to the tax collectors, sinners, and Pharisees who were listening to him that all these trivial and temporary riches, rules, and ceremony were all things that they may require that may require sacrifice, but was not what he was truly calling us to do, which is to show mercy. All the religious trivia in the world that you know, that they knew, will not make a difference in our heavenly calling if we do not know how to show mercy. One of the most popular parables, and certainly one of the first that you probably remember learning, is the parable of the Good Samaritan. Now, this parable is a response to the question that a lawyer posed to Jesus, who is my neighbor? 
Luke chapter 10, 25 to 37. Would you turn to the passage with me? Bibles in front of pews and stuff. Or phones. Sorry, Salt. Matthew 10, 25 to 37. Just then, a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now, by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said, Take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. Now, this is a story that we are really quite familiar with, but did you notice what the answer to the question, who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? The neighbor is the one who showed him mercy. This story is a parable, and what that means is that it's a story that is made up by Jesus to demonstrate a point, and oftentimes to demonstrate heaven in human terms. So when Jesus told the lawyer this parable, he not only made up the storyline, but he made up the places, and he made up the characters in the story so that it would be relevant to the people who were listening. The road from Jerusalem to Jericho was notoriously known as the way of blood because there was often blood shed there by the hands of robbers and thieves. So those who were listening probably understood why the Levite and the priest did not stop and help for fear of getting attacked themselves if they dilly-dallied any longer. But then he introduces, Jesus introduces into the story a Samaritan who were mortal enemies by birth with Jews was most obviously not considered a neighbor to the lawyer who was asking the question, who is my neighbor? But Jesus says, it's quite the contrary. The Samaritan, the one who showed him mercy, the mortal enemy who showed mercy was the man's neighbor. John Piper shares that we can see four dimensions of mercy in the Samaritan through this parable. First, mercy sees distress. In verse 33, the Samaritan is going along his happy way and he sees the injured man. He sees distress. Secondly, mercy responds internally with a heart of compassion or pity toward the person in distress. Verse 33 continues that the Samaritan not only saw him, but took pity on him. Mercy responds not only internally, but also externally with a practical effort to relieve the distress. In verse 34, he physically goes to the injured man, bandages him, and takes him to the inn, spends his own money. He takes care of this stranger. Mercy also happens even when the person in distress is an enemy by race and religion in this case. 
Samaritans and Jews are by nature just enemies. They hate each other, which we repeatedly see throughout the New Testament. And most representative of this is the woman at the well who was also a Samaritan and says to Jesus, aren't you a Jew and I am a Samaritan? Have you ever gone along your happy way and saw something or someone in distress? Maybe a coworker with their head on, on their desk or a car on the side of the road with their double blinkers on, hazard lights, or a classmate with books strewn on the floor and you're hurrying to class, or maybe a KPCMD member that you kind of know by sight but not sure if they're actually members of KPCMD because you know all Asians look alike or something. And you see them at the hospital and you're like, I don't know if I should go talk to them. Whatever the case, mercy sees distress. And then when you saw this person in distress, how do you respond? Let's just take the example of the coworker with, her, with his or her head on the desk, who is maybe your work arch nemesis. Maybe he's just better at taking better at talking so he wows people with his presentations or maybe she's more creative or whatever the case this coworker is not the person you look forward to seeing when you go into work every morning you see their distress what goes through your heart and minds is if that oh dear that report is not getting done today therefore i cannot get my work done today or is it i wonder what's going on do you respond with the heart of compassion or pity towards this person what would mercy do? And externally, what do you do about the compassion that you feel? Do you pass by his table or just tap her desk and tell them to get up? Do you bring them a cup of coffee? Do you put a hand on their shoulder and ask what's wrong? What would you do in this situation? What is your external reaction? What would mercy do? It's hard to tell what we would do unless we're actually in that situation, in the moment. But here's what mercy would do. It would have an eye for distress. It would have a heart of pity. It would make an effort to help. And in spite of being enemies, that is mercy. This past week, I don't know if you're aware, but World Vision America announced that it would allow employees to be in six, or it would employ employees of same-sex marriages. Previously, while they did not and still do not ask about sexual orientation or any personal life matters for that matter in their interviewing process, and employees, people, and they employ people of all races, ages, genders, religion, they didn't condone same-sex marriages. However, through this decision, they decided to approve it. And then, however, a couple days later, the board decided they have to reverse their decision, that it was unbiblical, and that they were wrong. It is speculated that it was under the pressure of the more conservative evangelical Christians, but who knows? As you can imagine, there's been an uproar about both decisions, or in some parts of the country, there have been an uproar about both decisions, and a significant group of people have withdrawn their financial support of children in need through World Vision. There has also been an influx of support for children in need in world, uh, through World Vision. And there were also people who withdrew and then supported again because they ch World Vision changed their decision. And thanks to this, my Facebook news feed has been interesting. I realize that everything that happened with World Vision and their various decisions in this past week can't really be summarized within a minute or two. But the point is this, that Jesus called us to mercy, not sacrifices. Yes, being merciful may absolutely and most likely absolutely involve sacrifices. But our calling is not to the sacrifice. Our calling is to the act of mercy. And if we are letting formalities arguments, or even personal convictions get in the way of acts of mercy, isn't that the exact opposite of what Jesus has called us to do? We've all seen the pictures and videos of children in um, underdeveloped nations or developing countries, skinny with bulging stomachs and from malnutrition. 
Not just that, but we've been seeing distress all over the world just 20 miles down the road. If we are letting the fact that World Vision is allowing same-sex couples or that they reverse their decision get in the way of our mercy, isn't that the exact opposite of what Jesus called us to do? Isn't that exactly the same as what the Pharisees were doing? When we let external circumstances and rules and regulations, laws and religious formalities dictate the way we do things, that isn't, isn't that the opposite of mercy? Jesus chose to illustrate the opposite of mercy with a priest and a Levite. That is, in this church, Pastor David and me. It is a warning to me and to the leadership of not just this church, but the church universal, who tend to be more caught up in the mechanics of religious activity. Oh, there needs to be a Bible study here, and a, and a revival here, and a retreat here, and a something here. Sometimes they have no eye to see the distress in the church members, no heart to respond with compassion, and no effort to bring relief to the gospel to the people, especially when they are the other. But let's think about it realistically. Can we really show mercy in every circumstance of our life? I mean, some of us have jobs that require us to be regulators of the law. I don't think we have any police officers in our church, but there certainly are people who hold jobs that are a little bit more strict in their regulations than others. They require us to enforce rules and that cannot be bent with mercy. How are we to differentiate when we show mercy and when we employ justice? Real life is very complex for Christians who seriously want to live out their life their faith in a sinful world. And the only answer to the question when you show mercy and when you can apply, the only answer to the question when you show mercy and when you apply justice is simply by getting close to Jesus as you possibly can. The Bible doesn't have an exhaustive list of how to deal with each and every situation. But as we come closer to Jesus and come to know his heart more and more, we can really start to understand what would Jesus do? Today's passage does not say, blessed are those who are merciful, uh, but who are always merciful, but simply blessed are the merciful. And those who are merciful will be able to show mercy even when times call for justice. Within the justice, there will be mercy as we bear witness to the truth that God is a God of justice. Every week, Pastor David, Becca, and myself get together and read this week's passage and share how God has spoken to us through that passage. And sometimes it helps us to get ready for the sermon, whoever is preaching that Sunday. One of the questions that was thrown out for us to discuss and think about was, how is grace and mercy different, if, if at all? I know the textbook answer I was taught when I was young, grace is receiving what Grace is receiving what you don't deserve, and mercy is not receiving what you don't deserve. Try explaining that to a 12-year-old. But salvation is absolutely by grace and not by works. Therefore, we cannot earn God's mercy by our mercy works. Earned mercy would be a contradiction of grace. However, what we do get at the judgment which will be so entirely and completely 100% at the mercy of God. When we receive that mercy, that is 100% grace. The fact that God is granting us his mercy daily and will show us ultimate mercy on judgment day is grace. When God asks for a record of our mercy on judgment day, he will not ask for a tally, but by his grace, he will look at our entire life history, or a medical chart, as it were, and read the evidence of mercy within our lives. And that's the difference. When we play mercy, we strong arm each other until the other gives up, thereby showing mercy by releasing each other or releasing the other from the pain that I am inflicting on the other. However, when God shows us mercy, 
It is not when I give up. God's mercies are not when he releases us from his plain inflicting grasp, but rather of him showing us his grace. Let us pray. Lord, your mercy endures forever. Your mercy endures forever. And we thank you for showing us your mercy. Lord, help us to live out mercy in our lives, in our daily lives. As difficult as it may be, Lord, help us to show mercy and not sacrifice. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.